Welcome to our six, sixth virtual primate conversations of the term. My name is Alejandra, and today I have the pleasure to welcome Katarina Almeida Warren. Katarina is a PhD student in the School of Anthropology at the University of Oxford, working with Professor Susana Carvalho. Katarina has a background in archaeology, primatology, and anthropology with a master's degree in human evolution and behavior from UCL and a degree in archaeological science from the University of Sheffield. By studying technological behaviors and use of the landscape by our closest living relative, the chimpanzees, Katarina aims to provide new perspectives in how our ancestors interact with the landscape how they made decisions about resource exploitation and the conditions that led to the emergence of technology in the hominin lineage, including the factors that led to the formation of early hominin sites. Her interdisciplinary research also includes pioneering work on the archaeology of the perishable by wild chimpanzees, making her the only person that I know that has worked with both perishable and lithic technologies of wild apes. I was fortunate enough to spend time with Katarina in the field and witness her unique skills as a field researcher. Katarina is now nearly finished with her PhD and already has several grants and awards like the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology PhD scholarship, the prestigious Early Career Grant from National Geographic, and several Boys Trust Awards. She has also a growing body of work that includes landmark publications, such as a major article in current anthropology on chimpanzee perishable technologies published earlier this year, as well as articles on primate archeology span and about methods on archeological mapping of non-human primate artifacts in poorly accessible environments. Welcome again, Katarina, and I pass now over to you. Thank you, Alejandra, for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm just quickly sharing my screen now. I hope everyone can see it. Uh, yes, hopefully. Oh, where have we gone? Can everyone, Alejandro, could you confirm that you can see the screen? Yes, perfect, we see everything. Okay, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so hi everyone, and thanks again, Alejandro, for a wonderful introduction. And as an organizer of the seminar series, since it's early days, it is a real honor to join our growing cohort of Primate Conversations guest speakers. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about my PhD work and specifically the last stages of the work, which is focused on uh, the computer simulation phase. This is still work in progress. Um, so I'll essentially be focusing on the process of building a virtual landscape from real world chimpanzee data. But first things first, why simulate? Well, simulations are regarded as the third leg of the scientific tripod, uh, sitting between empirical research, which is drawn from real world observations and theoretical research, which is seeking to explain the mechanisms and processes behind them. This is particularly useful tool to explore systems that are difficult to observe directly. So this could be because they take a long time, such an evolutionary process, or the scale is too large, or perhaps too small if we're thinking of quantum physics, or the population and landscape of interest no longer exists. Now, all of these are relevant in archeological and evolutionary research, but preservation is a particularly important component because often we are studying ancient systems that existed several thousand to millions of years ago. Now, of course, studying the present is important for understanding the past. There are many underlying processes that still exist today and happen today and have happened also in the past. And essentially, a lot of the work that happens in our lab is very much at the heart of this research. So we're using modern analogs as a window into looking at the past. Many of us are looking at our closest living relatives, the chimpanzee, 
uh, but also other primates such as baboons and vervet monkeys. And we're doing this to understand the relationships between behavior, group dynamics, and the environment. We also have researchers in the field, and actually they're in the field at the moment in Mozambique, uh, looking at how animal remains uh, preserve over time. And this is really important research to try and understand how much material actually preserves in the archaeological and fossil record. And a lot of this work is inspired and builds on um, early archaeological and anthropological work. And this includes work, uh, for example, by uh, Irvin DeVore on baboons, Jane Goodall on chimpanzees, uh, Lewis Binford and Glenn Isaac on uh, the formation of archaeological sites, and also Kay Behrensmeyer, who did a lot of research on taponomic processes. Now there do exist a few challenges when we're looking at modern analogs. Uh, one of the big ones is whether we are looking at modern chimpanzees or modern human populations. Uh, we are considering an, um, groups of populations that have evolved over several million years since uh, the period of time of interest. So there would have been lots of different uh, species happening around those times and those species would have had different anatomical adaptations, different dietary adaptations as well, and of course different behaviors. So we also need to try and bridge that gap between what we see in the present and what may have happened in the past. Um, related to that is also sometimes quite difficult to find a single modern environment which includes both a modern analog of the species that we want to in, uh, investigate and also the paleo environment in which they may have lived. So in this context, simulation can be a very useful tool to bridge the gaps and link the present with the past. Now, one form of simulation is, of course, conducting real world experiments. And within human origins research, much of this was pioneered by Nick Toss and Kathy Schick. And I'm going to try and turn on my laser pointer now. There we go. Um, and some of their work included creating artificial archaeological sites in different natural environments. And this was to try and understand how these sites would have changed over time and how the different environments would have influenced the preservation of the bones and the tools in those locations. Also conducting napping experiments, and this is to try and reproduce ancient forms of tool manufacture. And also controlled lab experiments, looking at how hydrological action may have affected the preservation of archaeological sites. And here you can really control the intensity of water, movement, and all of these things to try and really understand how um, archaeological sites may have formed in these environments. Now, of course, with increased technological advances and uh, computer, computational power, uh, there's increasing research going into computer simulation. And um, some of this includes trying to reconstruct ancient environments. If I can play that now. Sorry, not ancient environments, but reproduce how extinct species may have walked or moved. Also virtual simulations of tool manufacture and how the flaking process may have occurred. And also recreating ancient environments. So at its heart, computer simulation is really a simplified artificial representation of a complex real world system. It can be built using experimental or real world data, and it's often used for things like making predictions, investigating patterns and systems, guiding data collection, and even designing and conducting experiments. And it also has many gaming properties, which make it a really attractive tool for outreach and education. One increasingly popular form of simulation is agent-based modeling, and this is a bottom-up approach to simulation, and it looks at essentially individual entities and the interactions between them and their environment to understand global population level dynamics. So typically this could include an environment, which could be a neighborhood, a habitat, or even a country, a set of agents. Uh, these can be populations or individuals, uh, and they can all have different properties. So it could be uh, certain, it could be humans, it could be other animal species, or even types of vegetation. Crucially, there are a set of rules that guide their movements and behaviors and interactions. And all of this goes into the model to try and look at these global and population level phenomena. 
Within archaeology and anthropology, agent-based models have been used and developed to explore things like long-term social environmental change, cultural evolution and transmission, migration and dispersal patterns. But beyond this, it's also been looking at uh, evolution, the evolution of social complexity in primates, um, mechanisms of food sharing, and um, how memory might affect movement. Sometimes these models have used real world landscapes or they've also used simple abstract environments that have been recreated artificially. However, there have been comparatively few studies that address the paleoecology of early hominins. In particular, what can ancient stone tool assemblages tell us about the behaviors and landscape use of our earliest ancestors? Now, this question has actually existed for several decades, and it arose when Mary and Lewis Leakey found the, what at the time were the oldest stone tools in the 1930s. And um, since then, there's been a huge amount of, of research and hypotheses trying to understand uh, these connections, but we still don't really know the relationships between the distribution of tool sites and the material within those tool sites with the ecological uh, environment and also the behavior. So the search for answers over the last decades has further, de has further development of many hypotheses. Uh, often these are in inspired by observations of living species. So this could be in our industrial human societies, chimpanzees, even uh, carnivores. But also they've emphasized different degrees of social organization. Others have looked at um, the degree of ecological dependence, so how much individuals may have depended on their surrounding environment, and also have attributed different functions to different types of site. Now I've only included some of these hypotheses here, but actually there are many, many more, and a lot of them are still highly debated today, and that is largely because of the inherent challenges of working with archaeological data. However, there's been still some extensive research, uh, some extensive empirical research. Uh, this has largely focused on the relationship between the location of raw material sources, so the locations of tool sources and patterns of stone tool discard and how this may have affected hominin mobility. Um, there have been some uh, other work as well. Uh, this has been less common, but there has been some work on the relationship uh, between ecological factors and distribution of archeological sites to investigate changes of landscape scale patterns of, of stone tool use over time. And this work is, was by Rogers et al. in 1994. And there hasn't really been many studies looking into this further. More recently, however, there's been some research that is trying to use explanatory models and agent-based modeling. So uh, the hominins model was constructed to explore differences in dietary adaptations that had been proposed uh, for two contemporary hominin species. In this case, they were looking at early Homo and Paranthrus boisei. And in particular, they were interested in looking at um, how the introduction of digging sticks to access tubers and meat eating through scavenging affected uh, patterns of activity across the landscape. Since I've started my PhD, there have also been a few other interesting models that have been developed. One of them has been a chimpanzee landscape uh, study. Um, and this was to look at how chimpanzees may adapt to different environments in order to maintain homeostasis. So this is to stay within the uh, hydration and energy levels that are needed for survival. And this model specifically focused on the impact of living in extreme environments, such as savanna landscapes, which typically are quite arid and also may have um, less availability of food. And this model wanted to uh, use these chimpanzees, um, virtual chimpanzees in this virtual model to try and understand how these different environments and changes in environments may have affected early hominins like Ardipithecus ramidus. And finally, um, there's a model which is exploring uh, climate change and how climate change may have affected movement across the landscape. Uh, 
Uh, this one is looking at a specific uh, transition in South Africa around 12,000 years ago. And uh, this is around the start of the Holocene where a resource rich uh, coastal plain became submerged. And the model is examining how this may have impacted the foraging uh, strategies and survival of the populations in the region. Now, I really like this model because the authors brought together a huge amount of data. This is including uh, how much food is available in different types of vegetation uh, and also how long it might take to collect it. Um, also, this model is freely available and you can find it online. So if you ever want to check it out and play around with the different um, parts of the simulation, then um, you should really check it out. I really recommend doing that. So. All of these models use real world spatial data and different components of real world behavioral data as well, whether this is paleo reconstructions or of modern environments. However, they do differ, they do differ in a number of things. Um, for example, only one of them considers the use of tools, and this is looking specifically at um, wood based tools. Two of them include interactions between individuals. Uh, so they, they do include that into the model, how individuals may interact with each other. But the chimpanzee model, for example, assumes that all the individuals move around independently. Also, only one of the models gives individuals the ability of knowledge and foresight, and they use this for their decision making. And crucially, only one of these models performs a full empirical validation. And this is actually quite important because it ensures the model, um, because it ensures that the model is performing according to the empirical data on which the model was based. Um, so for my project, I really want to kind of bring all of these elements together uh, to investigate how landscape scale patterns of stone tool use inf is influenced by the broader foraging and ecological context. And I'm doing this primarily through investigating the ecological factors driving the spatial distribution of chimpanzee stone tool sites. And this is uh, focused on chimpanzee nut cracking, in this case, in uh, the field site of Bosu in Guinea. And I'm doing this to gain a better understanding of the relationships between landscape use, resource exploitation, and also, of course, the formation of archaeological sites. And this is sort of combining um, and um, modern analogs, so looking at modern chimpanzee populations, also using simulation to try and infer how patterns may have formed in the past. So the research process involves several elements, and I want to just walk through this a little bit with you before I move on to the next stages. So initially, it involved a stage of uh, data collection. This was primarily fieldwork in uh, Bosu, Guinea, as I mentioned already, and then also collecting some data from the literature. Now, a next step of this project was to conduct some preliminary empirical research because we still, at the time, didn't really know much about the relationships between ecological variables and stone tool use in chimpanzees. And so this empirical research really enabled me to understand how the current system works before moving on to creating a virtual simulation. So ultimately, then using this uh, fieldwork data and also data from the literature, uh, I worked on developing a computer simulation. <clears throat> and now uh, the next stage is sort of looking at model validation, which is what I mentioned um, a bit earlier, which is really fine tuning the model to make sure that it matches the BOSU system as closely as possible. Now, following this, um, my plan is to uh, look at some ecological questions. So looking specifically at how adjusting different um, ecological parameters may then be affecting uh, the distribution of stone tool sites. And this, through these ecological questions, I will be generating some artificial data that will be fed back into the original model and then create some data analysis and some conclusions from that. Um, as I said, this is still work in progress, so today I am mostly going to focus on this initial part of the research progress. So like with many aspects of primate behaviour, ecology plays an important role in primate tool use. From previous studies, looking into how technology and innovation emerge, 
uh, the, they have identified that uh, food seasonality, but also the frequency in which tool using opportunities are encountered, and also nutritional necessity may play a role in why tool use may be emerging in a population. Other work looking specifically at site location and uh, site reuse, these in populations where tool use already occurs, have also identified a few ecological variables that drive uh, these patterns. However, most of these studies have largely focused on where raw materials for tools are located and as well as the location of the target foods, so the foods they target to do their tool use. So in addition to looking at the resources needed for tool use, which is the target foods and the raw materials for tools, I'm particularly interested in the effect that uh, food, water and shelter uh, has on the distribution of tool sites. So these resources would have been critical for survival and they are still critical for survival for any species. And so for my empirical research, I wanted to investigate the effect of these variables on nutcracking on nutcracking site selection, reuse and inactivity. So this is what I was what I'm doing for the empirical research. Um, my primary data, so the fieldwork data, was collected from uh, Bosu in Guinea. And this is home to a long term wild chimpanzee field site since 1976. Uh, the population at the time when I was collecting the data was seven individuals, um, but now since the recent birth of a female, we are now at eight. Um, now, the Bosu forest is quite unique in that it covers a mosaic of different habitat types, and it's also relatively small so that it can be studied in its entirety in a relatively high level of resolution, which is quite useful for then translating this into a virtual model. The chimpanzees at this site here use portable stones as both hammers and anvils for cracking nuts, but they also have around 20 other forms of tool use, which includes ant dipping, leaf sponging and algae fishing. And all of these include um, use of plant based tools. So before I move on to some of the some of the uh, data collection and the findings of the initial empirical research, I want to just show you a short video of chimpanzee nutcracking in Bosu. Let's see if I can play this. So in the foreground, there's a juvenile chimpanzee, Banwa, and he's cracking nuts. Um, and in the background, there are a few adult chimpanzees as well. So in the wild, also, this skill is often learned through observation of conspecifics, uh, usually the mother, but also other members of the group. Um, and here you can see an infant engaging in peering behavior, so observing the nutcracking in action. Um, but also nutcracking locations are hotspots of social activity, uh, so tool use is often interspersed with a range of social interactions such as grooming and also play. So in Bosu, I worked with a team of amazing research assistants and uh, together we used a fully digital method of data collection to survey both the nutcracking sites themselves, as well as the ecological landscape within the chimpanzee home range. Um, so the different variables that we sort of collected and different information uh, for Tool use, we collected information on the location of uh, stone tools as, and as well stones that could be used as uh, tools. Uh, we also collected information on the location and distribution of uh, nut trees, which are the trees that provide the um, nuts for the nut cracking in this case, and also the densities and distribution as well as availability of the nuts themselves in the forest. In terms of food, we collected data on the locations of food providing trees, so foods that the chimpanzees eat. These could be trees that produce fruit, leaves, gum uh, and other resources. Um, and we also considered uh, foods that are sort of available to extract once or twice. So these would be small items of vegetation, which are known as terrestrial um, oh. 
terrestrial herbaceous vegetation. Um, had a bit of a blank there, but uh, yes, so terrestrial herbaceous vegetation, which are small plants that really can only be exploited once. Um, so we considered all of these types of, of ecological variables. And within that, um, we collected that data using transect surveys. So these were one kilometer transects and we collected data in a quadrat, um, quadrats that were spaced every 100 meters. And we collected in total data from 195 uh, quadrats in the forest. We also collected data on the location of water sources in the forest and then the location of uh, shelters, so the nesting sites, the places where chimpanzees slept. This data was actually collected using forest-wide surveys because we didn't have enough resolution from the transect surveys to really capture the distribution of, of this uh, data set. And in total, we approximately collected data on over 300 nests. And in terms of the tool sites, we collected data on 40 tool sites in the forest. So when we first inspected the data, we found that um, nut, the nut cracking sites only occur where a nut tree is located. So a nut tree is an important uh, variable and factor in, in determining whether a location is used for nut cracking or not. But there are a few other variables that had a significant effect on the chances of tool, suit, tool uh, site occurring in a particular location. So as you can see here, raw material had, uh, so this is stones for the use of tools, had a very strong positive effect. Uh, this is also the case for the number of food providing trees. So the greater number of food providing trees in an area, uh, the greater the chance that a nut cracking site would be encountered. And lastly, we also found a correlation with the distance to the nearest uh, nest site. So the further away we were from a, from a nest site, the less likely it was for a nut cracking site to be observed at that location. Regarding site inactivity, uh, the patterns weren't as strong, but we found that nut availability, so the decrease in nut availability, as well as the lower number of tools were significantly correlated with uh, the, the whether, <clears throat> whether a tool site had uh, experienced any activity within the last year. So that was our measure for distinguishing uh, whether a site was active or not. Um, I didn't include here a graph for this, but we also found that greater nut availability and proximity to nest sites also correlated with a greater frequency with which um, active sites were used. And uh, together, this evidence suggests that nut cracking takes place in areas that are rich in a number of resources, so both the resources that they use for uh, the tool use, so the nut cracking um, in this case, but also where other foods are and where shelter is. Um, and interestingly, this reflects one model uh, of landscape use that has been proposed for early hominin archaeological sites. And this is the favored places model that was proposed by Schick. I should also add, however, that water was not a significant predictor in any of these models. And this is likely because Bosu is a fairly humid landscape. Uh, so chimpanzees can get most of their water from the food that they eat. And there are also many water sources that are available year round. So once completing and sort of understanding better the system uh, of Bosu uh, through the uh, empirical research, and now moving on to the stage of transforming uh, the data collected into a virtual model. So with the Bosu data, that was all the environmental data that was collected, um, I used interpolation of the spatial data to generate base maps, um, which effectively have a grid system and each grid has 100 by 100 meters. And these base maps were then used in, fed into the um, virtual model. And I also retrieved additional data uh, from publications. And this was data that I wasn't able to collect um, for logistical reasons and other reasons in BOSU. Uh, and this included data on the energetic value of foods, um, energetic cost of travel, but also energy required per day to survive. 
In addition to this, I also collected data on the rates of uh, travel speed, so how quickly a chimpanzee moves in the landscape, but also how quickly they eat. And uh, lastly, I also collected data on the seasonal cycles of food availability for Bosu, um, because I was only there for eight months and I needed data for the 12th, so I gathered this information also from uh, published material. Now, all agent-based models have a set of assumptions and rules. Um, in terms of uh, scheduling for the model uh, I produce, um, each time step was set as a period of 10 minutes. And within this time step, only one action can occur. And this action can either continue in the following time step or it can change. So it, um, it can only change in blocks of 10 minutes. A chimpanzee day is approximately 12 hours. Uh, which is essentially daylight time. Uh, so one day in this model was set to 72 steps. Uh, also for simplicity, one year was set at 360 days. And then the model also has two seasons, which is equivalent to the seasons uh, in Bosu, a food growth season and a food decay season. Now, there is a growing body of evidence that suggests that chimpanzees make decisions about where they forage based on knowledge of their environment. So to integrate this into the model, I've given chimpanzees knowledge of the patches within their search radius. They also have a memory in which they can store uh, the recent patches that they have visited. Uh, they also have knowledge of nesting, good nesting locations within their environment. Um, this knowledge is also collective, which means that they can actually share this knowledge with um, other chimpanzees in their group, but the knowledge is also imperfect, so there is some randomness integrated into the model to consider the imperfection of memory. In terms of foraging decisions, chimpanzees are guided by an optimal foraging strategy, uh, and this means that they choose a patch which can provide the greatest energetic uh, gain while accounting for the energetic cost of travel, which effectively means that chimpanzees will prefer the nearer patches unless a more distant patch can provide a greater amount of food. Uh, and many of you will know that uh, chimpanzees uh, in the wild have fission fusion social dynamics, so which means that a population may shift between a large group and smaller parties throughout the day. Uh, there are potentially many reasons why chimpanzees group in this way, but in this model, it is solely based on food availability and uh, daylight. So in periods where there is uh, not enough food, um, a larger group may split into uh, smaller groups, and then smaller groups may get together into a larger group when uh, enough food is available for all of them, or it's close to nighttime. So being in a larger group effectively gives them some sort of safety in numbers during the night when they're sleeping. I should also add that the chimpanzees themselves don't uh, change within the model. So the model assumes that they are all adults and the population size remains constant throughout. So now I just want to walk you through a few of the specific procedures of the model um, and the main ones are foraging and uh, nesting. The nesting uh, procedure starts at the group level, so a group of chimpanzees will scan the patches in their search radius and using the optimal uh, foraging procedure basically they will choose the patch which has that highest uh, food availability relative to the energetic cost of going to it. And then they will start traveling towards that target patch. Uh, and they'll travel to it one patch at a time. So when they arrive to the next patch, they will check uh, several different things. They will check first if they've arrived at the target patch, so the patch that they had set in this condition. But they'll also check if the current patch that they're in is actually better than their perceived knowledge of that target patch. And then they will also check if the patch that they're in is better than the amount of food, the mean amount of food of the patch that they have stored in their memory. If any of these conditions are true, 
then they will stay at that patch and forage until every individual is no longer hungry or a better patch becomes available. If these conditions are not true, then each chimpanzee will check their hunger levels. And if they are hungry, then they will check if nuts and stones are encountered in that patch. If nuts and stones are encountered, then they will crack nuts until they are full or until no more nuts are available. However, if nuts and stones are not encountered, then they will snack. And this effectively is eating for one time steps of 10 minutes of food. Uh, they can also snack if uh, after they crack nuts, they are still hungry. Uh, so that gives them chance to snack for one time step again uh, afterwards. Once they are no longer hungry or they've already snacked, then they will continue traveling to that target patch and following these steps throughout the day. And when nighttime comes, then the agents, so the chimpanzees in this case, have to start thinking about building their nest. So again, this starts at the group level and the group will scan the patches within their designated search radius and select a patch which has the highest nesting suitability. Then they will travel to this nest patch uh, directly in this case. And once they get there, they will also check if there are other groups in the landscape. If there are, then they will make a nesting call. And if any of the other groups in the landscape hear this call, then they will join the original groups. This is the first group that decided to nest. They will travel to that nesting group and then together they will all make a nest. However, if the other groups in the landscape do not hear the call, then they will initiate this process themselves until all the groups present in the landscape have built their nest. So those are the basic um, sort of the main two procedures within the model. There are, of course, others, but I wanted to kind of focus on uh, those main important uh, processes. And um, I built the model using NetLogo, which is a free open source program. And this is sort of what the interface of the model looks like. Uh, so we have, I know the screen is quite small, but I will zoom in uh, very soon. Uh, but here we have a set of um, adjustable uh, variables uh, that you can change before you run the model. Um, then we have several different monitors here, which basically help us um, monitor and uh, see how the model is performing as it is running. So zooming into some of these things, uh, specifically the adjustable measures. Uh, so this combines both uh, things that will help uh, fine tune the BOSU model. So things that we're not so certain about, but also things that will help, excuse me, develop the model further after um, the verification of the BOSU model. So this is basically to explore other variables and other things that are not specific to BOSU. So things like population size in BOSU, at the time of my research, there were seven, but in order to explore how a larger group would be in that environment, then this allows us to increase the population size, also the minimum population size, and also switch the fission fusion on or off. Um, and also, as I said before, water didn't seem to have an effect in uh, tool site distribution in BOSU, but it may have in other sites. So here, this gives us the opportunity to switch on, on water dependence uh, and then assess the effects of water there in the new landscape. However, there are also a few parameters that are unknowns for BOSU that either we couldn't get from um, published data or just things that are really difficult to explore empirically. Uh, one of them is the type of foresight that they use. So we have a few options here. So local, whether they only look at the patches within a certain area around them or whether they have global knowledge of the forest. If they're using uh, the local foresight, then they have a set search radius, which limits the distance at which they can. And then also things like memory, which we don't really know. Uh, so this allows us to adjust how much, how many patches effectively are stored in the memory of a given chimpanzee at any given time. 
So just to give you a little uh, glimpse at what the model looks like once it's run for a bit of time. Uh, so here you see the main uh, Bosu forest with some of the chimpanzee groups moving within it. And then these blue squares here are effectively uh, giving us a sense of how many nutcracking events have occurred. So I think here white means greater number of nutcracking events and dark blue is lower number of nutcracking events. And then you can see in the monitors a few things. So here is the proportion of nutcracking events uh, relative to the number of visits to a patch. We also have here a graph showing the monthly food availability over time. Uh, here we have the mean daily uh, calories consumed by chimpanzees as well. So you can see this variation as well over time. And we have something here as well, just looking at um, how the numbers, um, the number of groups, but also the number of individuals within each group over time. And there's also a few others too. Uh, now, to give you a flavor of how the model works, um, I have a very short sort of video simulation, which probably will start as soon as I change the slide. Yeah. So uh, to keep it simple, I've just uh, changed two parameters. So in this left hand side, we have a population of eight individuals with a food density of 10 grams per meter square. And on the right, we have a population of 30 individuals with a max food density of 15 grams per meter square. Um, so here you see uh, the model running. This model is running at the moment over one year. And of course, it's sped up uh, so that you can see it um, at a much faster rate. But you can already see how movement between them and also the fission fusion dynamics and as well, the also the nutcracking uh, events are different between them. And this is uh, just to give you a flavor of, of how the model works and uh, how things occur when you're using different parameters. So right now I'm working on the empirical validation of the model. And this is in collaboration with uh, Dr. Nicholas Payet at the Cohesis Lab, also here in Oxford. And then process, this process basically involves running several iterations of this model in several configurations. And this is to find out the configuration or the configurations that best fit the real world patterns of nutcracking activity in BOSU. This animation just gives you a little glimpse of those iterations happening over time. Uh, and as I said, this is still work in progress. We're starting to get the data out of these um, simulations and models. And hopefully I can share some updates on this uh, very soon. So once the validation is complete, uh, I want to introduce new artificial base maps. And this is to test how different distributions of food, also the densities of food, um, availability of water, but also uh, locations of nests affect. Uh, and then in the long term, I would really like to run this model using a real world uh, paleo landscape. Uh, hopefully one that was used by early uh, tool using hominins, and that is to try and then look at how that may have affected their movement across an ancient landscape. And then ultimately, I would like to develop this model into a free resource for education and outreach, um, as I think it would be a really great way to engage with audiences in an interactive way. Um, the model is the, these models are quite easy to use um, and it's a really nice way for people to experiment and hopefully bring to life an ancient technological landscape for themselves. Um, now, none of this work would have been possible without the support of many of my collaborators and research assistants uh, in um, the field. Uh, in Bosu, um, I had my amazing staff um, and also my research assistants who were my teachers and taught me so many things about the forest and without them, of course, I wouldn't have been able to collect all the data that I needed for this project. Um, in Oxford, uh, also my collaborators, Professor Susanna Kudvaj, my supervisor, and uh, Dr. Nicholas Payet, who has been instrumental in uh, bringing this agent-based model and programming in that logo to fruition. And of course, thank you to all the institutions for permissions and logistical support and uh, financing in this project. And lastly, thank you everyone for listening.
Thank you so much, Kat, uh, for that great talk. Um, yeah, for those of you that are watching, Kat and, Kat and I did our PhDs. We started a few years ago together, so it's really, really nice to see uh, yeah, all the hard work you've put, been putting in over the years and just how impressive it is, really, combining sort of archaeological theory with modelling, uh, with animal behaviour, with field work. Like, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so amazing what you've done uh, and really bringing yeah, the archaeological record to life. So um, I'm going to try and go through some questions we have. And we've got uh, sort of an absolute load here. So we've got <laughs> themes ranging from sort of the wider implications for modelling human evolution, uh, sort of chimpanzee tool use, um, the demographics uh, of chimpanzee populations and the individual differences that we might find in different populations. Um, some of the sort of further variables you might be looking to like add to your models. Mm -hmm. um, and also we've also got sort of an idea of sort of anthropogenic pressures to chimpanzee which are facing all chimpanzee populations. So just mm -hmm. yeah, taking, taking <laughs> one of the questions to start with, uh, so how do you overcome the differences that uh, may exist between modern chimpanzees and early humans to validate your model? So, yeah, I guess that's along the lines of you know, we can use chimpanzees to model sort of deep evolutionary time. But is there a challenge when we get to modeling sort of later, more, more contemporary human populations? Yeah, no, that's a, a really important thing to consider. And uh, I mean, there's there's been a lot of uh, debate about um, using, for example, modern human populations as models because of the influence of, of technology. And uh, so the use of cell phones, for example, can also affect how people communicate and uh, be together wherever in the world. And that also obviously affects dynamics and, and all sorts of other things. Um, so there are always challenges with that, both with modern humans or even chimpanzees. Uh, I think really, with these questions is, is trying to, to understand um, what questions you can actually answer with the data that you have, um, because we, we really need these modern analogs and we really need the archeological evidence to kind of look into that. Simulation can go, as I said, in a way to kind of bridge these two things together. So you can modify whatever you have from the modern environment and add what we know from the archaeological data or the fossil data, right, in terms of locomotion, other things, to kind of bridge that gap. But there's always going to be a few things that we don't know. Mm. And I think it's really about sort of being um, thoughtful and considerate about the questions uh, we ask and what information is there really to kind of answer those questions. I, I guess it's like you say, potentially, like, that's the strength in the comparative framework, isn't it? That, I'm, I'm assuming that what you've applied here yeah. is like a really powerful blueprint that you can apply to human populations. Um, you know, lo local uh, people in, in Bosu crack also crack nuts, yeah. and we don't know whether uh, they learnt it from the chimpanzees or, or vice versa. And so you can really see that your work, yeah, why not apply to humans as well? Um, exactly, so yeah. along those lines, uh, so stone tool use in Bosu accounts for roughly 8% of their tool use time. So do mm -hmm. you think that that sort of percentage for stone, you know, is, is that measure way off for humans? Um, you know, how could this affect your model val validation? Yeah, so the frequency of stone tool use, I think I might know who asked that question. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. it, it, is a, it, it is always uh, something to consider. I think by modifying the model, so includes, in, increasing things like the landscape size and the food availability, could uh, change those patterns. So yes, nutcracking in Bosu is 8%. Also, the population is quite small and uh, that's also probably because they have so much other food available. So potentially nutcracking as a resource uh, for food isn't as um, needed. So there's less nutcracking activity happening there. But if you think at other sites like Thai, then uh, nutcracking happens seasonally. And also when it happens, there's a lot of it happening. So um, there's definitely things that are very specific to BOSU. Mm. Um, and it's trying to understand then, yeah, that's one of the next steps to be looking at how these things happen at other sites. And then uh, from that and from that collective knowledge uh, of both uh, BOSU and other long-term sites kind of bringing together how these different things may converge and 
basically gain a better understanding of these systems in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've had like a question along those lines about the small population at Bosu. Um, but I guess with Bosu, you also have a really rich sort of long history of research. Mm. And do we know like um, how their home range use has changed as the demographics have changed? Because they've only been a population of seven recently, right? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And one that I would also like to know the answer of. I think, I think the data is there. So hopefully it's something that can be explored um, later on, um, because I think it is something that's really important is trying to understand how both the reduction in population size of the chimpanzees, but also the increase in the human population in the area may have been affecting this landscape use, but also sort of the amount of tool sites that they're using. So I didn't mention this in the presentation, but we identified 40 tool sites and less than half of them were active. And some of them may have not been used for, you know, at least a decade, um, or they seem to have been very old in terms of sort of the residue and other things that they had on them. So those things and understanding this change over time is super important, especially for understanding sort of uh, the impacts to conservation and survival of the population and how this may affect other populations that are in this sort of human uh, wildlife uh, interactive mm. framework. So, um, yeah, it was interesting you, you were saying about we need we need this sort of time depth to explore, to look at behaviour. Mm. And you can do that with the archaeological record and the field notes. Yeah. Uh, and so on the sort of this case of Bossu, which is a really interesting case study in, in sort of the anthropogenic pressures. Um, so do we know, do you have a sort of inkling of, of how sort of anthropogenic pressures could have, could have shaped the, their tool patterns, the crop raiding, the sort of um, the encroachment of human settlements and agriculture? Uh, we have like a question here that is, do you think uh, sort of roads through the territory has you know shaped their access to the home range? Um. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you, you've, I don't know if uh, you noticed the odd shape of, I mean, you know that, now, but <laughs> yeah. most people will probably question why, why the Bossu Forest looks so strange. It's because there are roads running through it. And uh, to cross kind of those two hubs of the forest uh, to reach, they do have to cross a road which has traffic and other things. And uh, I, that's not necessarily my research, but uh, there's lots of uh, great research by Kim Hawkins and other people uh, from Bosu and other sites that are looking at the impact of uh, things like roads and other anthrop anthropogenic disturbances on uh, behavior. Some of it is avoidance, of course, and the restriction of landscapes, but then there are also uh, other behaviors like, I think this is, I think it's Matthew McLennan, and colleagues, and I apologize if I've quoted the wrong paper, but uh, in which they are sort of using new nesting sites in uh, response to sort of anthropogenic change in, in their field site. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's it's an interesting case study. Like I, I was saying that, you know, just at Bosu, you have this intensive provisioning yeah. of tools and nuts. And actually that might be an interesting simulation mm -hmm. in terms Absolutely. of opportunities for learning yeah. um, uh, that could, yeah, influence, I guess, their... Yeah, um, models have kind of <laughs> almost an unlimited potential. So, and it's it was really hard when I was doing it. I was like, oh, I could do all these amazing million different things. And I was like, hang on a minute, I don't have time for this. <laughs> Maybe give me a 50 year PhD and I can do everything. But uh, I think there's definitely a lot of potential uh, and especially in Bosu, for example, for exploring how anthropogenic action, which is not something I integrated into the model, but would be important for other things, uh, how that sort of affects uh, landscape use and other things. And it's something that you can model to predict, make predictions, but also guide other other policies and, and work as well in the future. Um, so you said that, uh, yeah, you had to be really, as with most research, you really had to be sort of stringent with the variables you included and yeah. to, to try and get sort of a working product to start with. Like, there's some questions here, like, you know, what sort of variables uh, would you sort of consider adding to, to really make the model more, more complex or mm -hmm. um, explain? Um, so I'm just trying to think, like, we've got one here that says, like, could we integrate social learning um, mm -hmm. into there somehow? Um, 
Yeah, so that that would be, and as I said, you know, in the model that I used, sort of assumes that all the chimpanzees are adults, <laughs> so that yeah. nothing nothing ever changes. The population doesn't increase, which of course is not natural. So that would be an interesting addition to that. Would then actually having a dynamic population, which you have um, offspring emerging, and of course all the chimpanzees uh, dying, and then also having this transmission of behavior and knowledge over time, which could be uh, definitely modeled. I can't think off the top of my head how I would do that, but it's definitely <laughs> something really interesting to include. And that would obviously yeah, add complexity, but also would have a greater time depth to the model really to kind of see this accumulation and generational changes over time. So that would be, would be really interesting. Another thing that um, because of time constraints, I haven't done, but sort of at the moment, the variable for nesting sites is basically based on where nests are located, but um, ultimately, ideally, that would be based on the parameters that are used for, um, that are associated with suitable locations for nests. So even though every, there are lots of variability in each uh, chimpanzee population seems to have different sets of parameters. There are a few things that overlap, the sort of things like tree height, height of the lowest branch, density of branches and slope and all of these things that, you know, are so complex to put in the model, but there are probably a few small elements that can be put in to kind of make that um, nesting selection a bit more dynamic, not just this is where we, this is a good place for shelter, <laughs> but not sort of looking at the underlying mechanisms for that as well. Yeah. So I'll just on the sort of, I'll try and get most of the questions regarding the models out of the way because yeah, there's endless things that you could do, as you were saying. <laughs> but uh, we have another one saying, uh, very interesting model. Thank you for explaining and sharing. Is uh, dominance hierarchy something you could consider in, in the foraging model? Mm. Um, or is this, yeah, something that you'd hope to implement? It's just- <laughs> Yeah, so that that's obviously another really interesting thing to look at uh, is, uh, of course, <laughs> I, I'm not so familiar with the, with the literature on this, but of course, if you look at uh, chimpanzee um, behavior and social structure, there's usually one chimpanzee that takes the lead, usually the dominant, but it could be, you know, within females, it also happens that a higher ranking female may take the lead on direction and where to go. So this dynamic and looking at who is leading the way to different things and the knowledge that they have, right, is also an interesting thing to look at. Um, but also looking at how dominance may affect um, the dominance of, of tool use, for example. Mm. Uh, there's research by uh, Susanna, uh, Susanna Carvalho, which, is, uh, which has looked at dominance maybe affecting uh, access to certain raw materials. And so that could also affect uh, how tool use occurs and who has more access to those things and so on. So that would definitely be, be something interesting to explore, yeah. So moving away from yeah, all the endless variables you could be adding to your uh, model, there's one sort of idea you've been mentioning about, you know, we've used one use case here with BOSU and it'd be yeah. great to apply it to other sites, uh, other environments as well. Yeah. Uh, and so we know that chimpanzees use a huge sort of variety of activities beside nutcracking. Yeah. Uh, you've recently sort of written on uh, the perishable and how influential the perishable can be for our understanding of human evolution. Yeah. So have you any thoughts that how you could extend what you've done here as a model to uh, perishable tool use? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I think <clears throat> in the BOSU context, there's definitely some potential for including perishable tool use into that, uh, especially tool use that is kind of spatially uh, determined so mm. you're looking at the algae fishing which is where they sort of fish in a specific you know there's only a few ponds in the forest where they fish for algae so that spatial location is a good way of looking at how that may be affecting um, other forms of landscape use and also because often that algae fishing I believe is seasonal so it kind of happens only at specific times of the year so that could also mean that at certain times of the year maybe they use that area more that might affect sort of their landscape use as a whole but then other forms of behavior like uh, ant uh, fishing where the ant nests are not necessarily fixed in the landscape that make things a bit more difficult to model because it's kind of a bit random or at least 
you don't I don't think I mean maybe you can predict where ants mm. ant nests occur I'm sure someone yeah. someone has done research on that and sort of um good locations for ant nest constructions and so on so that that makes things a bit more complicated complex to integrate but when you think about termite fishing which is stuff that I have been doing in the past and, and working with Alejandro on that as well then it it should be fairly easy but also really interesting to to translate then this um, stone tool um, landscape into looking at the plant tool landscape of termite fishing as well. Awesome so I think we've we've covered a lot of questions <laughs> I'm sorry I bombarded you um, but yeah I was just maybe just thinking about like the wider implications and sure. you're, you've been saying that you you really want to apply it to different chimpanzee groups different species different environments so, you know, can we, you know, do you envision us being able to um, reason about the social systems of hominid ancestors and, you know, the implications for this long goal? Or, or you know, is, is there a lot of steps that has to be in place before we can start uh, applying this model yeah. to specific environments? Um, yeah. I, uh, yes and no, because it's kind of, and of course, there's so many things interact in different ways and there's so much complexity. And then it also depends on sort of what questions you're trying to address. I think one thing with uh, generating this model myself was I realized that I really had to be very specific in the question I wanted to ask and specific in the variables so that this model could be produced. Um, because otherwise, you're just sort of thinking, oh, what about this? What about that? What about that? Which is also really interesting. But in, in for the purpose of time, you kind of have to be like, oh, no, I need to keep on track and keep on these things. But I do think there are already some models that are looking at social systems. I think I mentioned uh, one which was looking at uh, social complexity in primates, which I think, I mm. uh, can't remember now off the top of my head, but I think part of it was to look at how this may have been uh, the emergence of, of social groups and social grouping in, in early hominins. I think what we're missing at the moment, really, and this in, in part, again, is time and you still don't have enough computer power and other things, is bringing all of these things together. So you have, as I sort of explained with some of the models I give examples on, you know, they're focusing on different bits. Um, and I tried to bring quite a few things together, but of course, and then there are other models who are looking at these social dynamics and others that are looking at, uh, which I didn't talk about, but sort of the influence of where raw materials are located and topography on landscape use. But it's it's really trying to bring all those things together that I think is, is still a big challenge and um, both computationally, <laughs> but also in terms of time. Um, but yes, ultimately you could probably eventually use the model I've developed to try exploring those things within this context of tool use. Um, but um, I don't know how feasible it is right now with, with the knowledge and the computational power that we have. But yeah, it would be really interesting to explore. So do you think it's it sort of shaped, it's changed your perspective, since starting this research project, it's changed your perspective about hominin tool use? Um, and, you know, do you think that, you know, there are some sort of frameworks or ways that we can start to interpret the archaeological record and the way that we're um, excavating hominin sites from your experience of sort of, you know, and your knowledge mm -hmm. of visiting these chimpanzee um, sites, not cracking sites. Are there, are there things or signatures that we, sh we should be looking for? Or um... Yeah. I think at the moment, uh, because we're still sort of in the analysis state, I can't really... <laughs> yeah. say much about the actual model itself in terms of the output other than sort of what I've just yeah. learned from observing chimpanzee behavior. Um, there are definitely sort of differences in terms of how we think about hominin stone tool use versus chimpanzee stone tool use. Uh, but I think looking at it, because at, at the moment our knowledge of hominin stone tool use so far is still flaking technology for the most part. We don't mm. really there is some evidence of, of, of tool use, like a nut cracking and so on from, from late biological record, but when we're looking really early, sort of the origin of tool use, we don't have a lot. And this is something not just from my own research, other, other researchers like 
so that I could evaluate our supervisor and others as one well and discover these things that we haven't been looking for yet. So the types of tools that were being used and these relationships with the landscape. So, I mean, hopefully the data that I'm finding in these relationships would also help identify potential locations uh, to find new tool sites and potentially earlier tool sites uh, if we, you know, have the resources to do that and get that far. And, uh, yeah, hopefully that will be some exciting stuff coming ahead, but there's just so many ways you could go with this. Mm. And I think you, you're sort of, it's really great to see uh, you try and bring all these different threads together from the archaeology and the, and the chimpanzee behavior and the archaeological theory. So yeah. um, I, think I think you're doing an amazing job and thank you for uh, giving such brilliant talk. Um, thank yeah. you. <laughs> it, was, it was great to ask you these questions and finally get some more depth into your uh, research after a few years. <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone for joining and, and for the, all the fantastic questions that we've bombarded Kat with. Uh, just, a, <laughs> just a reminder that uh, next week on Tuesday at the same time at 3pm, that's the 23rd of November, we are really excited to have Carol Ward on the shape uh, of human evolution. Um, so please uh, join us on, online then and we would be happy to see you again. But um, one last thank you to Kat for her, her brilliant talk. Thank you so much for having me. I think we're still alive. I think we are still alive. We'll wait till someone pushes the button because I can't find it. <laughs> no, I think it has to be Alejandro. Still alive. <laughs> At least we can crop this afterwards.